So I'm going to start this video with an observation I made the other night of Jupiter. When I set up the telescope, I could see none of the Galilean moons. And that is because they were all in line with Jupiter itself. As the time lapse ran over the course of several hours, the moons once again became visible. It's not something you see every night. So now I'll just play some footage that was taken on that night and then the rest of the video will be some information on telescopes and equatorial mounts in general. So I currently have the telescope pointed at Jupiter and you'll notice that we cannot see any of the Galilean moons. That is because right now all four of them are in line with the planet itself. Over the next few hours they will become visible once more. And that's what it will look like at 4am here in Perth. It's a beautiful night with fresh air coming in off the water. There's the telescope pointed up at Jupiter. So I'll just let it go all night. So I've spent the last few nights tuning and testing this mount and I have it working nicely. On my last video, there was a request to explain why I chose this mount and telescope for my recent purchase. So let's take a look at that now. This mount is a Skywatcher HEQ5 Pro. It's a mid-size equatorial mount with a payload capacity of around 30 pounds. The telescope is a Skywatcher EVOSTAR 72ED refractor and I have two ZWO cameras, one on the main telescope and one on the guide scope. We'll look at those cameras in a little more detail later. Firstly the mount. So as we know the purpose of an equatorial mount is to compensate for the rotation of the Earth and this allows us to take long exposure photographs of stars, galaxies and nebula. In order to do this, we need to align the mount as accurately as possible with the Earth's rotational axis. And that is why an equatorial mount will have a latitude scale. Here you can see the indicator is close to 32 degrees because I'm almost at exactly 32 degrees south latitude in my present location. And that means this axis is actually aligned with the Earth's rotational axis. And when it rotates, it is compensating precisely for the Earth's rotation. And that is why the stars will remain fixed in the field of view when doing so. So being a mid-sized mount, the rated capacity is 30 pounds. And that is the weight of the telescope, the guide scope and the cameras not including the counterweight. I have another mid-sides mount in Sydney, the Celestron AVX, which is also a very good mount. I had considered purchasing the same model here in Perth, but I have one of those already, so I decided to try a mid-sized option from Skywatcher. And another reason I chose this mount is because it is white. The Celestron AVX is black, and when I use the solar telescope in the sunlight, the black frame gets quite hot. I have another Skywatcher mount in Sydney, the AS EQ6, and I generally use that with the solar telescope because the white stays nice and cool in the sunlight. So that was another factor when I considered purchasing this mount because I will bring the solar telescope over to Perth at some point and use it on this mount in the sunlight. So an equatorial mount like this will have two clutches, one for the right ascension axis and one for the declination axis. With the clutches engaged, the mount is rock solid. I cannot move that telescope by hand. If I release the right ascension axis, 
I can rotate this axis. And the purpose of that is to let you balance the mount carefully. As you can see, I can put that mount in any position and it will remain there. We balance by moving that counterweight in or out to accurately match the weight of the telescope and the cameras. I can lock that axis now and release the declination axis clutch. And that lets us balance the telescope as well. Again, as you see, the telescope will remain in whatever attitude I set it. And that means it is accurately balanced. We achieve the balance here by moving the telescope fore or aft in the base. So you can see a number of cables. Each camera has its own USB cable and I have marked the main camera with a red elastic band. We then have the control cable, which generally goes down to the handset. If you're sitting outside, you can control the mount with this handset. I generally don't operate that way anymore. I operate my telescopes remotely using Google Remote Desktop. And there you can see the interface. So it's showing that the laptop is online. There's no physical connection required. It's all done through Wi-Fi or even across the internet. And in fact, these are the other computers that I have at home, which I can control from here in Perth. To do that, we need to unplug this cable from the handset and use a USB to serial adapter, which then plugs into this laptop. To power the mount, we have this 12 volt cable that ends in a plug that fits a standard cigarette lighter socket. So I just have this camping style power supply, which will also keep the laptop charged and the mount running for more than 24 hours. So let's set it up and I'll show you how the remote desktop works. So the mount is now powered and connected to the remote laptop in addition to the two cameras. And this means the handset is completely redundant. I usually don't even fit it to the mount. I just did for the purpose of this demonstration. Now presently, the monitor is showing the screen from my MacBook. To view the screen from the remote laptop, we use the Google Remote Desktop icon. And there we can see the laptop screen. So at this point, we launch the software that controls the mount and also a planetarium program. The software I use is called Green Swamp Server. Skywatcher has its own, but I prefer this one because it has a nicer interface. Here West. So the mount is now connected, and as you can see, it has a graphical indication of what the mount is doing. We then fire up the planetarium program, and I use sky charts, which is completely free and works very well. So now we connect this software to the Green Swamp server. And this reticle is showing us where the telescope is pointing, presently at the South Celestial Pole. At this point, we can click on any star and ask the mount to slew to that position. Slewing to coordinates. If we choose something on the opposite side of the meridian, and the meridian is directly north in the southern hemisphere. If I pick a star on the opposite side, the telescope will do a meridian flip to point to that second star, which it's doing now. East. 
Fluing complete. So you can see the telescope is now pointing at that star. At this point, it will now track that star using a single axis of rotation. And this is the flat earth killer. The fact that we have a polar aligned mount oriented according to latitude and a single axis of rotation. Now tracking the stars, it tracks at the sidereal rate. And if you look at the setup menu, it shows us what that rate is. Not exactly 15 degrees per hour, that is for the sun. Slightly faster than that, because the Earth rotates 360 degrees in slightly less than 24 hours. So I could spend more than an hour showing you the imaging software, but that isn't the purpose of this video. We're looking at the equipment at this point. So now we're going to look at the telescope. But just a tip, if you're setting up your own telescope, I always try to route the cables as close to the point of rotation on the mount as possible. So you can see the two cables from the cameras go down close to the point of rotation for the declination axis. And then they are fed down through this point, which is close to the point of rotation for the RA axis. And by doing that, if there's any slight resistance on the cables, it's going to provide the least resistance to the mount. In fact, this part of the mount rotates with the RA axis. So the whole thing has almost no friction. So the telescope, a Skywatcher Evo Star 72 ED. Now this is fitted with a ZWO 183MC camera. There is almost an unlimited variety of combinations that you can use with telescopes and cameras. And it really boils down to what you intend to image with the scope. For me, I chose this setup to get a fairly wide field of view so that I could capture a number of satellites in a single frame. It also allows me to capture the entire circle of the moon and with a solar filter, the sun. A more powerful telescope and a different camera may not allow me to see all of the moon or all of the sun within one frame. A powerful telescope is great for looking at the planets like Jupiter and Saturn, but not so good if you're trying to see multiple satellites. And that is the reason I chose this telescope. We're going to look at a site called Astronomy Tools and their field of view calculator that lets you match a variety of cameras and different telescopes, or we call them optical tubes, in various combinations against different targets. So you can get an idea of what the image is going to look like with your equipment. So what I bought recently in Perth is just the mount and the optical tube here, the telescope. This is exactly like the one I have in Sydney. And that is another reason why I chose this model. The camera and this field flattener are from the telescope in Sydney. I asked my wife to remove it, pack it up safely and ship it over to me in Perth. This is a tuned system with the field flattener and the spacing to the camera perfectly matched. So all I had to do was plug it straight into this telescope and I was good to go. So here is the Astronomy Tools website and the URL is astronomy.tools. If you select field of view calculator and go to imaging mode, you can now choose your telescope and camera combination. The target we'll use is the moon and I'm going to select my telescope, the Skywatcher 72 ED and the camera I have fitted to it the ZWO183MC. Now using the maximum resolution on the camera, we're going to see this type of image. With the imaging software, we can select whatever resolution we choose. I generally use 3840 by 2160, which is 4K resolution when you render a time lapse. And we get that field of view. 
As you can see, it frames the moon very nicely. This is what it actually looks like. When you zoom in, you can see just how much detail this small telescope is actually capable of. So if you're planning to buy a telescope, I strongly recommend using this site first to ensure your combination will give you the type of images you're looking for. Let me show you what happens if the telescope is too powerful. I have now selected the Celestron 9.25 SCT, which is my big telescope at home. With the same camera, you're going to see that. So obviously you cannot see all of the moon. Now you can actually get a camera that will give you a wider field of view. The ZWO294 is a great camera and I have that one as well. That's going to give you this type of image. Again, that may not be what you're looking for. If you use completely the wrong combination, such as a 290 on this telescope, it is absolutely useless for the moon because that's all you're going to see. Just that part. However, if your intended target is Jupiter or Saturn, it's going to look a lot better. You'll get that type of image that's more in line with what you probably would want to see on the planets. Conversely, if your target is the planets and you have a small telescope with the wrong camera, you're going to see this. And that's not very exciting at all. So you have to match the telescope and the camera to your intended target. So hopefully that answers the question and provides some useful information for anyone considering purchasing their own telescope. I realize this is different to my regular content, so please let me know if you'd like to see more of the same. I can produce videos on astronomy or aviation in general. However, if you prefer me to continue with a flat earth destruction, I'm more than willing to oblige. It's always fun to expose their nonsense. I think at this stage, we realise that Flat Earth is essentially dead. There are only a handful of Flat Earthers remaining that are still producing content, and nobody takes them seriously anyway. So thanks for watching. I appreciate your time, and please let me know what you'd like to see more of.